two, one. There you are. All right. Popping up all over the place. So let's share away. Is that your law office, by the way? It is. I'm guessing. It it's a law library, an old fashioned law library where we, you know, set up one of our Zoom stations. We have three in the in the office. I mean, it, it is it is perfect for that. Um, but, you know, it's funny because it's it's just been so long since I've seen that many it is. law yeah. techs. You just don't see it anymore because everything's online. Yeah. And, and look, you know, my father is still very proud that we have a well-stocked law library where we update the pocket parts every year. So, really? We do. We do. It's a lot of money too, Matt, by the way. It's, it's actually one of the expenses I'd hope to cut for our law firm, but we still do it. Yeah. I was just going to say that is not, that is not a cheap, a cheap endeavor. It's also time intensive. What my first, my first uh, internship when I was in high school, I worked at a law firm. I had met the guy. I was. I used to be a caddy, and I carried bags. And I met him. He said, "You want to be a lawyer? Okay, come work on my law firm." And I remember going in and having to put the inserts in. Um, I did that too. When you were allowed to call people like myself gophers, when you you know, I worked for my dad and his law deceased law partner Frank Basil, who was a you know somewhat of a, a legend of the insurance defense industry in, in South was. Jersey. And, uh, you know, I, I could tell you, not only did I have to do the pocket parts, Matt, I used to have to oil the shelves. <laughs> yeah, I used to have to take all the books off, clean them, and then oil them with this, like, you know, lemon oil. It was pretty funny. So, oh, that's, that's, that's awful. I'm sorry. <laughs> it, 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 it's a OK. And I used to take the lunch order for the entire office back then when I was a kid. There was a great deli down the street called Arthur's Deli where they, you know, made their own corned beef and and pastrami and I used to walk there and and get the you know the lunch order for the entire office it was pretty funny different time just a totally different time it was a different time times are a changing that's for darn sure Dan and Art have you had a chance to share this I have oh no I forgot I haven't gone on Facebook yet wait a minute <laughs> <laughs> I've been so en en engrossed in everything that's going on here that I forgot to uh, to go on Facebook. Now, now, this is amazing because, you know, as some people may know, I'm on Facebook all the time. Right. And, um, but what can I tell you? Well, we're in no rush. Or at least I'm not in a rush. I'm not in a rush, not at all. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm all set up here. Before we came on, we were talking a little bit about uh, having a long day. I had a long day, so I'm uh, I'm set up here. I have my uh, grilled cheese that my lovely wife was nice enough to make for me, even though she worked her rear end off today. And uh, I've got a uh, little bit of Willet on the rocks. Nice, nice. Yeah. Had I known you were going to do that, I would have gone, to, you know, into my office and, and poured myself a Blanton's and brought it over here and, and, and done that but I don't I don't do it every night you know oh, when we do, oh, when, God, we do no. the, when we do I mean only you know when, sure. when the mood strikes like last week we had Regina G on um you know Governor Christie's former chief of staff uh, GSI uh, and an absolute brilliant woman by the way I mean uh, brilliant brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. and she was throwing so much information at us I just I just kept the black coffee the entire time because I needed to be focused it was like college you know, some classes you need to have one thing in your cup. Some classes you need to have something else in your cup. I needed to be fully alert to absorb everything she had to tell us. And it was a great conversation. But this week, we're also going to have a fantastic conversation with my friend of, of many years and fellow South Jerseyan, um, an unapologetic conservative, um, relatively new to the legislature, um, he was yeah. the hero of, of 2019. Um, and also one of, in addition to having wonderful taste in pizza, we want to talk about pizza tonight. He's also easily the snappiest dresser in the entire New Jersey state legislature. Um, you see some, um, awful, awful, awful fashion faux pas on a daily basis <laughs> up in Trenton. 
<laughs> it's not a very beautiful place, but our friend, uh, State Senator Mike Testa of New Jersey's first legislative district, um, always has this great synthesis going between Italian Clark Kent and Atticus Finch. It's like a nice blend. Well, well thank you for that. Uh, you know, and, and had I known that you were going to be imbibing, I, like I said, I would have loved to have a virtual a virtual drink with you, but you know, I did not do that. But uh, you, you've always said about the, the Italian American Clark Kent and I, and I appreciate that. And it was funny, I knew my, where my father was in municipal court one day, because he said, you know, the, the prosecutor, I'm forgetting his name, he described you as the Italian Clark Kent. I'm like, oh, Matt Rooney. I was like, it had to be Matt Rooney. I was like, I was like he's the only one that says that. So it had to be Matt Rooney. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's my, that's my line. Now. Yeah, so. Yeah. Ah, I just, I, I want to, I want that to work its way into New Jersey politics. If you're okay with it, if you want me to stop, you can tell me to stop. I am 100% okay with it. I mean, I can tell you, I, I think I got glasses in eighth grade and, and, and in ninth grade at Vineland High School at the 910 building, one of my friends said, you look like Clark Kent. And that became my nickname for a few years there. So the fact that you picked up on that independently, you know, I, I guess, you know, I have to stick with it. I'm have, I have to be okay with it. There's definitely worse nicknames you could pick up in New Jersey politics. So if, that, if, that, if that's as bad as it gets, roll with it. Um, I, I'm, exci I'm excited to have you on, though, tonight, because even though um, I've known you for a number of years, not just through political stuff, but, but the sure. legal world, um, you know, we obviously cover you a lot, write about you a lot. We talk a lot uh, about various things that are going on in Trent. I think this is one of the first times we've sat down for a full form interview. We talked to you a little bit back at the NJGOP summit. Yeah, that was probably the last time we were together. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly, you know, that was, you know, what a week before the world ended, so to speak, you know. That's right. Um, first time yeah. we used hand sanitizer and I spilled <laughs> some on your pants. That's right, that's right, Art, you did. You did spill, you, you spilled hand sanitizer. And, and I still remember the, the att one of the attendants that worked at the casino there was saying like, you know, how, backed up the men's room was and he said and it's because people are actually washing their hands which disturbed him oh. because he said now i realize that most people were using the men's room weren't normally washing their hands so he was Ooh. he was very disturbed by that so I, 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 I still remember that you know because everybody was so afraid and i mean and think about it that was just a few days before we were we were told by you know as i like to call governor murphy king phil that we had 15 days to flatten the curve. And today I, I believe marks 347 days into that 15 days to flatten the curve, which, you know, quite frankly, I think a lot of New Jerseyans, I know, I'll speak for myself, are sick of. I think, you know, we need to see the light at the end of this tunnel and we need to open New Jersey back up, get our kids back in school and open up our businesses for sure. Well, to your point, it's so we gotta been start wearing latex gloves for casino chips. <laughs> right. <laughs> no doubt about it. But I mean, you're right. It's 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 one of the reasons I thought this would be a great time to to invite you on and, and have you join us because you you consistently have been one of the most vocal voices in New Jersey opposing these these lockdown measures, um, which I think now we've seen definitive scientific proof have actually in most cases made things worse and probably prolonged. Um, the pandemic, or at least made its effects worse in, in certain contexts, certainly in the nursing homes. But sure. even even beyond that, um, you know, we're coming up on this one year anniversary. And even though there's plenty of evidence that um, the curve hasn't just been flat, it's it flatlined and it flatlined a long time ago. Phil Murphy still has dictatorial powers. Um, I, that word gets thrown around a lot in politics, dictator, dictatorial. But sure. he has served as a king now with no opposition other than from a few conservatives such as yourself in the legislature for almost 12 full months. And there's no let up in sight. He's starting to tease that maybe we're gonna be back to normal with schools in the fall. Maybe he's gonna start loosening up some more restrictions soon. We know some of that's because he's on the ballot this year, but it's, it's, it's gotta be one of the most frightening times I've ever lived through, through for that reason, if no other, that we, we've had a man acting as a king for a year um, and most, most elected officials, most leaders were completely silent. It had to disturb the hell out of you. It, it certainly does. And, you know, I have colleagues like Senator Panaccio, Senator Doherty, Senator Singer, who have been really vocal about 
hey, look, we need to put a check and balance on our governor's executive powers and his ability to continue to extend his executive orders. Not to, not to continue to issue executive orders, that's certainly within his purview, but we tried to put you know, a stopgap in there in the legislature, and it was a bill originally sponsored by myself and Senator Doherty um, to allow the legislature a review of any executive order after 14 days, and that the legislature would have to either renew that executive order or to say, we're not going to renew it. And that would not prevent the governor from issuing a new executive order, but it would prevent him from continuing to extend his own executive orders ad infinitum, as we've seen here, what Governor Phil Murphy has done. And what happened? I mean, we saw Senator Weinberg, Loretta Weinberg, uh, make the motion to table um, those bills twice when we made the motion to relieve those bills, because of course they were languishing in committee and were never going to see the light of day. So in effect, you know, on, on partisan lines, the Democrats have voted to take the power away from themselves in the legislature. So they've essentially made the legislature less than a separate and equal branch of government that it's supposed to be. Well, they're like the teachers union, they don't wanna to have to work. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it's it's unfortunate. You know, obviously, I got elected in 2019, and I'm very proud of that fact. But I wanted to go to work, and it just it disturbs me that here we have a separate but equal branch of 40 of us in the Senate, 80 of us in the legislature, 80 of us in the Assembly, and here we are, just allowing this governor to rule with an iron fist, and by way of executive order, and extending his own executive orders. I find, so, that dis I find that disturbing. Well, I, I got to ask you, uh, Senator, because uh, Senator Panaccio and the two of you have been aligned and, and personally, I mean, full disclosure, you're a couple of heroes of mine. But he said now uh, that he compared this situation to what's going on in New York with Cuomo. And he, of course, referenced uh, putting all these people uh, in nursing homes. Uh, and he said that uh, that Governor Murphy should be stripped of his emergency powers, just like Cuomo is being stripped of his emergency powers. It appears it's going to happen by the by the New York legislature. Should do you agree that Murphy should be stripped of his emergency powers? Absolutely. I mean, and what what's been most troublesome about and look those individuals who perished unnecessarily in long term care facilities and nursing homes because those facilities were forced to take COVID-19 positive patients into their facilities. I mean, I, I've said it from the very beginning that that was obviously a horrific move and that there's blood on the hands of the Murphy administration. Worse, let, let, let's go back and, and look at Governor Cuomo of New York. He was applauded for every single thing that he did, even earning ridiculously so, an Emmy, an Emmy Award for his actions during COVID-19. Whether we like it or not, and I certainly disagree with everything Governor Cuomo did for the most part, yeah. he was at least leading. Governor Murphy was just following Governor Cuomo's lead, it appears, blindly. You know, he never, he never was the first to act. He was only following Governor Cuomo's actions. And, you know, Getting back to all the way back in March 27th of last year, and, and I know this, this sticks in my head, is that you know I stated that the state's efforts to protect the people from the coronavirus should not be taken as a license to suppress the liberties of its citizens. And I said that there's a thin line between good public policy and heavy-handed government control. And that the priorities of public health and the preservation of civil rights must be secured in tandem. And I remember I was vilified on social media for, for even making such a statement that, you know, I'm trying to harm people, trying to kill people, I'm putting people at risk. But this is what we warned about. I mean, and, and I hate to say I told you so, but I told you so. There is no doubt that the coronavirus is serious. There's no doubt that the coronavirus has taken the lives of thousands of people. It's touched all of us. But I've also said from the beginning, 
we are the land of the free and the home of the brave. And that if, if people wanted to exercise their liberties, they absolutely should be able to. And if someone wanted to quarantine in place and stay locked down in a bunker-like fashion for the past year, that's certainly their prerogative and their right to do so as well. But the fact is we've crushed so many of our businesses in the state of New Jersey, and we are harming our children tremendously, harming our children by not allowing them in their schools, by preventing them from socializing, by preventing them from participating in their sport. It, it makes absolutely no sense. It's horrible public policy. We're harming our economy and we're harming our greatest asset and that's our children. Yeah, and, and, to, and to your point, Senator, uh, the letter I think you were referring to, March 31st, 2020, we have it, plenty of other people have it. It's out there, it's saved for pos posterity. Um, signed by uh, Judy Persicelli, um, the nurse who needs an introduction. No patient resident shall be denied readmission or admission to a post-acute care setting solely based on a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19. Now, granted the, the pandemic was still relatively fresh in the news cycle on March 30th, but at that point we already had a pretty good handle on who was most at risk when it came to succumbing to COVID-19. And it was certainly our elderly population concentrated in long-term care facilities that had one or more comorbidities. Um, and the Murphy administration, just like the Cuomo administration, packed New Jersey residents into these facilities to die. And, you know, I I have to tell you, as much as some of the allegations against Governor Cuomo coming out of New York right now are, are, are deeply disturbing, um, and if true, under themselves warrant getting his ass kicked out of office sure. um, by impeachment or by a, the actions of a prosecutor, um, you know, I, I still feel as if it, it's so frustrating to see that these thousands of deaths, which so clearly could be correlated to the actions of these two men, are almost kind of like a sideshow. They should be out. They should be out in center, out in front. Um, you know, I can't think of the last time in the Western world where duly elected leaders were singularly responsible for so many deaths. It's, it's outrageous. And I know, I think you mentioned it a minute ago, there's some independent hearings coming up um, beginning yes. this Friday. Um, what's your role going to be with these hearings? And, and what, what are the, what's the Republican Party hoping to uncover um, as they engage in these independent hearings? You know, it was supposed to be an independent hearing, not that it was a partisan hearing, not that it was a bipartisan hearing. It was supposed to be a nonpartisan hearing. You know, we obviously invited members of the Democrats in the legislature to participate in these hearings because yeah. a lot of questions need to be answered here. If we're supposed to be following the science, well, what science were they following, as, as to use your words, Matt? by packing long-term care facilities with COVID-19 positive patients. What science were they following? If the, data, if the data were going to drive the dates, what data were they following to drive these dates? And I wanna know what they knew and when they knew it. I mean, look, you, you, know, you and I are attorneys by trade. I just want questions answered. I mean, I, I wanna run this sort of like I would a deposition and just ask questions and get honest answers as to why these things happened. And look, I get accused of engaging in hyperbole and overstating these things. I agree with you 100%. These issues with our long-term care facilities should be front and center the entire time. Thousands of people died because of a decision made by the Murphy administration to pack our long-term care facilities with COVID-19 positive patients. And as you said, We've known from a very early stage of the COVID-19 era that our most vulnerable population were the elderly with comorbidities. It, it, it didn't need to be Dr. Fauci, who's been colossally wrong about a whole lot of things. He was telling the, people to take cruises <laughs> not too long before the, the period of time we're talking about. Right. You can find the video online. Take a cruise if you're young and healthy. At, at any given time, he has said everything and he has contradicted himself so much that it, 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 it makes your head spin. I, I wanted to ask uh, 
Senator Testa. Jack Cittarelli has now said he wants to see all the communication between Murphy and Cuomo. How do you feel about that? I'm an attorney by trade. I always ask this, and I'm sure Matt will agree with me on this. I want all of the information. Let me weed through it. There's never too much information that we can have. I agree with Jack 100%. We need to know what the communications were. Because again, this is so colossally incorrect to put COVID-19 positive patients in New Jersey's nursing homes, veterans homes, and long-term care facilities where over 8,000 deaths have occurred as a direct, or to use our language, Matt, as a proximate result of the Murphy administration's decision to do so, it absolutely makes zero sense. And, and, and Dan, to your point about Dr. Fauci, originally you didn't need a mask. Originally, COVID-19 was never coming to our shores. Now that we're now apparently we need two or three masks, you know, I, th I think most people are suffering, you know, from they're just tired of COVID. They're tired of this era. They want it to be done. And look, it's not done yet. But we, but Matt, to your point earlier, we have certainly flattened the curve. As I said, I believe it was back in June or July. We haven't flattened the curve. New Jerseyans were tough. They, we did everything that the Murphy administration asked us to do. We didn't flatten the curve. We crushed it. We crushed it. And, and we know, look what happened in New York. Governor Cuomo sent the comfort home. There's a reason why, because they didn't need it. Yeah. It, it, you know, it, 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 it's, it's unfortunate, but. No, you know, no under, uh, that, that's the key point, right? That most of us are on board with the original goal flattening the curve. I have family that are, that are uh, you know, in the healthcare profession. They were on the front lines. I wanted them to be able to do their job. I did not in the greatest nation on the face of the earth with our wealth and our bounty and our resources and our technological capabilities to be in a position where we had to say, mm, you know what, we're going to save that grandma, but not that grandpa because we don't have enough beds. That's unacceptable in the United States of America. Everybody agrees with that. Sure. But once that goal was satisfied, that should have been it. So you have to at some point, and you tell me if you think I'm being too dark or conspiratorial, you have to at some point think this has more to do with the statist ideology of a guy like Murphy or Fauci, right? That they're, they're enjoying the control they have over our lives. You can see it not just in the arbitrariness of their decisions. Like you talked about mass a minute ago. We found that at some point, the Murphy administration was advocating penalties for long-term care workers that were wearing masks. Then, you know, flash forward to this winter, he's telling you to wear a mask while you're shoveling outside. Figure that one out. But also the absolute- That was a great problem. cartoon you had, by the way, on that, you know? It, it, this, well, this stuff writes itself, right? Right. But, but if they, to bringing all this full circle and wrapping it up with a bow before we headed to these hearings, if the Murphy administration wasn't doing this because the governor was on a power trip, there would be no problem in showing us his math, saying, listen, this is what I'm looking at. This is the science that backs up my decisions. It's firmly rooted in things that are concrete and objective, not which side of the bed I rolled off of this morning. Sure. Um, and I can defend it in, in court or in, in a hearing, or if I'm challenged by a guy like Senator Mike Testa, he can't, he can't do that. And it's, it's also true with the regulation specifically on our business communities. And I wanted to ask you about that as well tonight. One third of our small businesses in this state that existed in February, 2020 were gone by New Year's 2021. Snuffed out of existence, our small businesses. Yeah. The Jersey Shore has certainly taken a hit. Uh, your district takes in some of New Jersey's iconic shore communities, um, specifically Cape May County, some of my favorite places on the planet, Ocean City, Sea Isle, Avalon, Stone Harbor, the Wildwoods, Cape May. Are you concerned about them heading into the summer? And have you attempted to engage the administration to get some kind of assurances that our small businesses of the shore are going to be able to operate and earn money and entertain tourists from New Jersey and around the world? I mean, absolutely. Look, Cape May County is the second highest 
tourism tax dollar generating county in the state. Number one is Atlantic County due to the casinos. True. Each and every year, Cape May County sends approximately $500 million in tourism tax dollars to Trenton each and every year. Obviously, the tourism industry is the backbone of Cape May County. There's, there's no two ways about it. And that, you know, the large part is the summer season. Now, we, granted, we have the shoulder seasons of the spring and the fall, but, you know, the meat and potatoes of the entire industry is the summer tourism industry. There's no doubt about it. I want to give kudos to the then the Cape May County Board of Chosen Freeholders, now the Board of Commissioners. They had a phenomenal reopening plan back in May of last year, and it was a ramping up plan. It wasn't a, a plan that people would think was crazy. Hey, we're going to open up at 100 percent. It had goals by dates. And of course, if numbers were spiking, there would be a rollback. It was such a good plan that Atlantic County adopted the plan verbatim. The casino industry adopted the plan and, and, and adapted it to their industry. Again, it was such a good plan that Senate President Sweeney put his stamp of approval on that plan, and it has languished on the desk of the Murphy administration since May of last year. So now that's 10 months, okay? Hey. So, and, and, and hear me out on this. This is where we get, where I get frustrated. And I think you can even, I can even hear my own tone of my voice change. During the height of the summer season, Cape May County accounted for less than 2% of all COVID-19 positive cases in the state of New Jersey. 2%. 2%. So we shut down an entire industry for, in Cape May County for 2%. It, it makes absolutely no sense. It, it's throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And you heard Governor Murphy say he was going to take a surgical approach to the state of New Jersey. And look, I use the analogy that in surgery, you use a scalpel, not an ax or a meat cleaver. He used an ax and a meat cleaver to Cape May County. He decimated what is supposed to be a phenomenal tourism industry. And these folks are responsible. And in the, in the talk about your, you know, what you made the remark, Matt, about a statist mentality. You know, this is a, a mentality that says they know what's best for you. And there's no trust placed into the captains of industry that exist in Cape May County and everywhere throughout our state. But those restaurant owners, the people who run the amusements, there has to be a level of trust from the state to those business owners that they're not going to harm their employees and their patrons during the COVID-19 era. And there is no level of trust. It is just do as I say, and as we've often seen from the Democrat leadership throughout the United States of America, it's often do as I say, not as I do. But yeah. you, you have a place that's another pillar of tourism, which is Florida, which is quite a contrast, Senator, to what happened here. I would, would you have, would you have had New Jersey follow the same path that Florida has followed? It's, I would have certainly followed a much more similar path to, to the, the pathway that Florida has followed. I would have followed the plan that Cape May County came up with because it was a sensible plan. You open up at 25%. If you don't see a spike in numbers you, you, and you don't con continue to see a spike like Cape May County did not see in July, which is the height of the season, you go to 50%. Then if you don't see another spike, you go to 75%. It would have made all the sense in the world and Matt, to your point and answering Dan's question, it would have followed the science and there would have been a scientific method followed there that, hey, if there is a spike when you open up to 75%, maybe you have to roll back to 50%. And maybe we would have been able to achieve getting through the end of this tunnel much sooner had we done that. But we didn't do that. So we really can't know because you know, we've been under these executive order restrictions since March of last year. So Dan, you know, to your point, I would have followed a much closer pathway that Florida has followed. And look, I think Governor DeSantis is going to look like a hero at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly gotten him some presidential attention, right? He came in second at CPAC to Donald Trump. I mean, a distant second, but anybody was going to come in a distant second sure. to the Donald at CPAC this year. So he's gotten a tremendous amount of attention 
um, despite the fact that a lot of attention prior to, uh, you know, recent days has been focused on the senatorial class. So he's definitely a guy to watch. Um, moving forward, something I want to address with you because it's, it's, I'm watching the comments tonight on the Facebook live and I appreciate everybody that's tuning in tonight. Please know that even though we get very distracted by our conversation, I am watching what you're saying. Um, a very common criticism that we get here at Save Jersey because, you know, even though it's nowhere in our bio, it's nowhere in our mission statement, people assume that if you complain to us about the New Jersey Republican Party, we are going to then transmit that to elected Republicans. Um, maybe there's some truth to it, but in any event, um, I, we keep hearing, oh, you know, Republicans are talking a good game criticizing Murphy, but in these other states, we see Phil, uh, governors being hauled into court. We see legislature, le legislatures overriding the governor. We see things actually happen. Here in New Jersey, it's been all talk and Phil Murphy's been unchallenged um, <laughs> since the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, that's, that's, that's just not true. Um, and it's also a little oh. bit of a simplification of what's been going on. So I was wondering if maybe you could just give this an overview. You mentioned before the efforts to try to restrict the governor's ability to auto renew his emergency orders. Sure. Um, we wanted to curtail them to 14 days. Some of the other things that you've attempted to do to try to rein this governor in and maybe why it's so important that people get off their asses and vote Republican in November. Well, I'll address that first, why it's so important. All 80 seats in the assembly are up and all 40 seats in the Senate are up. No better year to change the culture in the state of New Jersey yeah. than this year. And obviously we have a gubernatorial election, you know, as we want Murphy to be one and done in 21. There's no doubt about mm -hmm. that. But for those who are saying that Republicans are not acting, um, they, they really could not be more wrong. You know, I was President Trump's attorney on the vote by mail issue. There's lawsuit number one, okay? Lawsuit number two, I, I sued the governor regarding the budget. Remember the $9.9 .9 billion that the Murphy administration wanted to borrow. Uh, due to the Su New Jersey Supreme Court's decision, they only, you know, only wanted to borrow $4.4 billion. Right. And now we find out just last week, Matt, just last week, we find out that their projections for revenue were $3.2 billion short of their projections. Yeah, I wanted to drill down on that a little bit later because I could hear your blood pressure just pulsating about 40 minutes Being away. They, they got 3.2 million more than they they were projected, right? Correct. Yeah, they, yeah. they had a, they had a 3.2 billion dollar projection shortfall. So, yeah, they had a 3.2 billion dollar windfall essentially. And and unfortunately, due to the way that they borrowed the money, the bonds that they have, you're not allowed to pay them back early. So there's almost no real redress there other than me saying Hey, hey, folks, I told you so, you know, um, so this is this is a real problem with, with our state. And also, look, Governor Murphy and his administration have picked winners and losers this entire time. If you owned a liquor store, a marijuana dispensary, or you were a big box store, you were a winner. If you were a small restaurant, a, bre a local brewery, you lost. So I still have a lawsuit that's pending in the appellate division as we speak. I also am one of the attorneys uh, suing the governor and the attorney general over making New Jersey a sanctuary state. You know, so the fact that people can write on Facebook or any other form of social media that Republicans aren't doing anything. Well, you know what? I'm involved in how many lawsuits against the governor? That's doing something. You know, whether we win them or not is, is not due to poor lawyering or anything of that nature. We're here to fight. And, you know, when I ran in 2019, I promised to be a fighter. And, and I'm proud to say I made promises and I kept those promises that I was going to fight the radical left agenda of the Murphy administration. And, and I think during the entire COVID-19 era, which nobody could have predicted, they've shown their true colors. They've shown who they are. They've revealed how far radical left and statists they want to be. So you got to vote because we have a far left Supreme Court. Um, as if you didn't know it already, we certainly found that out in the borrowing case, um, which we're going to talk a little bit more about in a minute. 
But, sure. you know, I, I think that so much of it, and I'd be interested to hear what Art and Dan have to say about this because they also run political news websites and they get a lot of blowback from people and they, it's, a, it's like running a focus group on a daily basis. People are frustrated. So they're looking sure. for that, that proverbial silver bullet that's going to um, put an end um, to this affordability crisis um, here in New Jersey that's going to bring our lives back to normal, that's going to end everything that's wrong with how Trenton operates. But unfortunately, it's just not that simple. Phil Murphy was elected in a turnout of only about one third of registered voters in New Jersey. You, you got to go vote. You got to participate. You have to have a robust non one party government. Um, whether you want to vote Republican, whether or not you just want to participate, vote for somebody else. I mean, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm just trying to say that if Democrats keep controlling everything, nothing's going to change. And it doesn't matter how many lawsuits Mike Testa or Doug Steinhardt or Jack Chitterelli or yours truly files. It's just it, it's going to be a, a, a drip in the ocean. Um, so I, I just wanted to make oh. that point because you're the best guy to make that point because you've been in the trenches in this respect. Uh, listen, Matt, I appreciate that. And, you know, I'm the first point, one to criticize the Republican Party in the state when they've got their heads in the sand. We, you know, I challenge anybody to find a website in the state where you can find more digital link, um, you know, calling out Republicans for being insufficiently Republican. This is not valid criticism. Right. That one that one is absolutely not a valid criticism whatsoever. And and look, you know, I, I thank you for the site that you run, because, again, I think a lot of people use that as one of their news sources in this era where a lot of people don't feel that they can trust traditional news sources. So, you know, I, I really thank you for that. Well, I, that, that brings me to social media, uh, Senator. And what I see among other things, because you're, you're in my mind, uh, you have come on like gangbusters. I mean, you were just elected, it seems like yesterday. And you've come on like gangbusters. You're, you're not the traditional Republican. Uh, you're not uh, what I would call uh, the country club Republican, the to the manner born Republican that has been so common here in the state of New Jersey and so listless and so disappointing. But you have made extraordinary effective use from the very beginning of social media. Where did that come from? Why did you decide to do that? And how's it working out? It, it came from the fact that I knew during the campaign side of things that I was never going to be able to match the money from the machine that I was running against. That I knew I needed to get out my own news, um, create our own hype, so to speak, and put out the facts that I wanted the people that were eventually hopefully going to be willing to vote for me, I needed to be essentially my own news source. And, and look, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to give kudos where kudos are due, you know, sources like Save Jersey, um, you know, for how many years, you know, think about that. I know Matt started Save Jersey while he was in law school and any, any, the title fits it because New Jersey needs saving. There's no doubt about it. And, and, and Dan, I can tell you, look, I knew I was going to be in a dogfight back in 2019 and that it was going to be a somewhat dirty mudslinging fight. And I think, I, I, you know, I think that when anyone is running for office, they're better off being in that, in that type of fight, because that means they're going to take that fight right to their office when they are in fact elected. Um, you know, to be honest, I haven't really changed the game plan whatsoever and I knew, and look, I've invested in social media too. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I've, I've made a, a real investment in my social media because guess what? Republicans don't get covered. <laughs> we just don't. I mean, you know, think about it. I mean, in 2019, I was the only Republican Senator elected in the United States of America. The United States of America. You didn't hear about that on the news. I mean, and, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back what, whatsoever. And, you know, you have someone like my running mate, Antoine McClellan, yeah. first African-American elected to the legislature from Legislative District 1. How was that not national news? I've seen, I've seen folks on traditional news sites that got elected to, you know, the school board, city council, and they're being applauded on, on 
mainstream media, mainstream news. Antoine McClellan was a footnote. That's ridiculous. He should have been all over. And he wasn't even covered by Fox. And a Democrat super PAC in one of their attack pieces actually artificially darkened uh, Antoine McClellan to make him look blacker, which we know is a racist tactic um, that has been used in uh, American campaigns from time to time. Um, it was a Democrat super PAC that did that. Um, had the roles been reversed and it had been a Republican PAC that did that, um, you would have had MSNBC, Rachel Maddow, uh, CNN, um, Jim Acosta would probably be, a, you know, a popped the tent and li been living on Mike Testa's lawn demanding comment <laughs> every five seconds. Um, yeah. It's the double standards unreal. And I think LD1 didn't get enough attention in that respect because it really was an example how the double standard is a, is a, is a clear and present danger to American democracy, but you guys overcame it. You did. And, and I'm so glad Dan asked that because social media was a key part of it. And for any candidates watching tonight, um, and I know Art would definitely back me up on this, something to test the campaign did that seemed subtle, but it was so important is I heard from him and his campaign manager on a regular basis. And I'm not talking about kissing anybody's rear end, because if you know anything about myself or any of these other three guys on here, none of us are rear end kissers. It's just not in our DNA. But it was they recognized that we had an audience where there were people that they needed to reach. And they also recognized we were outlets that would report their message fairly and undiluted. So I heard from Senator Testa, this future Senator Testa at the time. I heard from his campaign. I heard from his campaign. We, I got guest posts from Senator Testa. And it was great content for our website, but also we were able to reach people that I think the Republican Party has been missing for a long time. So sure. in, in a cycle like this, where again, as Senator Testa says, all the legislature, uh, legislative seats are on the ballot. There's tons of down ballot races. You need to be using social media. You need to be reaching out to your local non-traditional news outlets, not just us, but those in your community. Sure. Because you're missing people if you don't. And if you don't do it, then you can't complain when the media, the traditional media, kind of boxes you out. One hundred percent. I mean, look, we if there's anything to learn from game plans that we've seen that have won, and, and, and Matt, I think you and I talked about this back in 2019, when yeah. President Obama won his first election, yeah. he was really the pioneer of, of using social media in an election cycle on a large scale. And, and look where it got him. You know, we, we can't continue as Republicans to criticize the other side and not utilize their legitimate tactics. I mean, we're not going to engage in any type of illegitimate tactics whatsoever. But, you know, what, what you said about Antoine McClellan, look, like he, he's he's like a brother to me. And, you know, we weren't as close at that time. But, you know, that was, you know, you said it was a racist tactic to put on a mailer, but apparently not quite as racist as Dr. Seuss. Right. I mean, that, that that's where we're at in this country that, you know, we're and, and, I, and I use this all of the time. And Tim Donahue, Mike Donahue, Brittany O'Neill, they all they they love this statement that I make. I said, well, you know, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Yeah. And, and and that's what, you know, the radical leftists, that's where they are right now. You know, I mean, it, it's getting to the point that we're, you know, in our emails, we're seeing preferred pronouns and things of that nature. And it's, you know, people are getting so offended by everything. By everything. I mean, I never thought that. I'd see the day where Dr. Seuss was vilified. And, you know, the president yesterday, President Biden said, we're going to remove Dr. Seuss from Read Across America Day. Any reference to Dr. Seuss? It's about his birthday, for crying out loud. Uh, to when tell this man who said he wanted a more civil America, okay, and echoed a previous president who talked about a kinder, gentler America, this man, Joe Biden, basically called the people of Texas, Neanderthals. And he got away with it. He got away with it. And he'll continue to do so. Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, this, any president, any vote for Joe Biden was not a vote for Joe Biden. It was a vote against Donald Trump. We know that. Nobody is thrilled, I think, with President Biden. I don't think anybody can look me in the face and, and have a legitimate argument that they're thrilled 
that Joe Biden is the president of the United States. I mean, this guy, again, like Phil Murphy, continues to provide us so much low hanging fruit for, for us just to pick off the tree. It's, it's, it's laughable. It really is. I mean, and look, I, I respect the office of the president of the United States. I'm not trying to demean the office whatsoever, but this individual has, has issues. I mean, and it's very clear to me and he gets away with things, you know, like what you said, Dan, calling an entire state Neanderthals. I mean, how pompous is that? You know, again, I just, I see America as, as a, as a country we're supposed to celebrate our freedoms. And how free are we that we can live under executive order for 347 days? How free are we at this point? We're not, where's our liberty? I mean, we're getting back to like really basic notions of what our founders established this nation for, you know, and and I'm, and Dan, you're gonna like this one, I know it, you know, from Cicero, Plato to Tocqueville, to Hamilton, the, the people that really, the genius minds that created this nation, the greatest nation the world has ever known, I can only imagine how they'd be scratching their heads thinking about 347 days lockdown because of what? Well, to your point about getting back to basics, I mean, when have in history the good guys ever been on the side of burning books? When have the good guys ever been on the side of infringing upon the right of free assembly? When have the good guys ever been on the side of criminalizing certain speech and saying that certain speech has no place in the public discourse? The battle lines have never been clear. Um, and anybody who doesn't see it, I admit, you know, I mean, being like you, Senator, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer in New Jersey. So many of my dearest friends do not share my political beliefs, but I am losing patience with people that don't appreciate how absurd things are getting out there and how scary things are getting out there. And it's, it, it, it's coming from the left. It really is. Um, you know, something that I, I want to ask you, uh, because we're focusing right now on the negativity that surrounds us. And we have to be honest about it. It's out there. There's a lot of bad things happening, but there's some good things happening too. And I think an under discussed aspect of your biography and what you're all about, what you do on a daily basis, you're still the chairman of the Cumberland County Republican party. Sure. And the Cumberland County Republican party, from those of you, for those of you who either aren't familiar with New Jersey politics or you're not from South Jersey. So for you, it's just all one big landmass outside of Philadelphia. Uh, you know, <laughs> there's Philly and New Jersey Shore, and then there's this vast test of country in the middle. Um, Cumberland County is not what we would traditionally call a, a red state, right? Sure. It's, it's a very diverse county. It's got a lot of working class white voters. It also has a large number of black voters brown voters. It has a lot of immigrants. It's got working class communities. It's very much the kind of place where Republicans um, need to do well if they're going to expand that big tent that we're always trying to build and expand upon. Now, you, Mike, that's that's the part of the world you're from. Sure. Um, You're from violence, so you did quite well there personally, and you've had some success in recent years kind of taking what was once a solidly blue county and all of a sudden giving it some fairly competitive elections such that the Democrats who are affiliates of the larger Norcross machine in South Jersey have had all of a sudden, they've all of a sudden had to work pretty damn hard to hold on. Um, so maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about both some of the success you're having in Cumberland County, that part of LD1, and also uh, maybe some of the uh, larger lessons you've taken away from your success and maybe what Republicans can learn from. Look, you know, Cumberland County is interesting. You know, we've only had control of the used to be called freeholder board. Now the board of commissioners um, four times in the last 40 years. Um, Right now we have a six to one Democrat to Republican board of commissioners. Uh, Doug Albrecht uh, was my running mate in 2019 and won. And he was the top vote getter, you know, in Cumberland County, we are down approximately 13,000 votes the day we start the election um, because there are 13,000 more Democrats registered than Republicans. However, we have a large pool of unaffiliated voters in in Cumberland County. And, you know, to your point, Matt, 
we have to go out and do things that we're uncomfortable doing. Going into areas that Republicans don't necessarily like to go. Um, yeah. You know, we have to be honest with ourselves. We, you know, to, to Dan's point, we have to make sure we have a social media presence. We have to, you know, go to local businesses and talk to them, talk to civics groups, talk to, you know, name, name the group, whether it's, you know, Rotary, whether it's um, any type of charity group, you have to, you have to be there and show your face and show you're committed. And it takes a long time to do that. I mean, look, I have the benefit of having two generations of my family name prior to me be really invested in the city of Vineland and in Cumberland County. I mean, there's no doubt about it. I get to stand on the shoulders of my grandfather, Frank J. Testa, who was a superior court judge. The local municipal courthouse is named after him. You know, there's no doubt that I get to have the family name and the benefit of having that. Um, but, you know, I was always willing to be heavily involved, whether it was the downtown improvement district in, in the city of Vineland. So, you know, you know, Dan, when you said I came out like gangbusters, that momentum was building since I became, you know, a lawyer in 2001 and moved back, you know, in, into the family business in Vineland. So, you know, that was 18 years in the making, so to speak, um, when, when it happened. And I, and I think people need to, you know, a lot of folks, Matt, when they, when they decide to run for office, might not have been involved in their communities prior. And I think the best way to, to, to build a brand for yourself prior to running for office is be involved, be that little league coach, be, you know, be on the downtown improvement district, be on the Rotary Club, do, you know, do those things. And, and, and look, if someone would have told me in 2017 that I was ever running for office, I would not have believed them. But what I did see, what I did see, Dan, from the traditional way many ran their races, and this isn't a harsh criticism, this is a constructive criticism, was that they weren't necessarily running to win. They were, they were running. And, 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 and it just made no sense to me There's that a difference. if I was going to run, I was going to run to win. And, yeah. and I wasn't going to play dirty, but I was going to go, I was going to leave everything on the court, so to speak, or leave everything on the field. And, and I think that's the type of mentality that we need to bring to our elections. And instead of many times the thought that they'd rather lose with nobility, I'm not a fan of losing. I want to win. And I think a lot of folks come to the table as a candidate, okay, with losing with nobility. Well, you know what, my head's not held high if I lose. So Matt, I think, you know, someone like Doug, Doug Albrecht, top vote getter, our commissioner, it's phenomenal guy, he needs help. We're going to send him some help, I believe this year, um, because there are fractures in that party. Now, now, this is for two years in a row. Now there's going to be a democratic primary for the commissioner positions. It's an accomplishment. We're, we're moving forward. I'm, I'm, I will say I'm envious of Chairman Donahue in Cape May County, where it's just, you know, a sea of red. God bless him. I mean, you know, I, I hope to one day be able to get to that here in Cumberland County. But, you know, we, we made history in, in 2019, and we were the first legislative district to be flipped in 28 years. I mean, so, you know, when I, when I see those comments, and they do get frustrating that we're not fighting, or you're no different than other Republicans, or what is the Republican Party doing? Well, people should pay attention better, get on our Facebook pages. And as you know, Matt, from, from running Save Jersey, a lot of it has to do with the like and share, you know? We, those folks have to like your content and share it. We have to rely on those folks to get it out there because the traditional media sources aren't doing it for us. They're not beating down Republican doors to do it for us. We have to do the dirty work ourselves, and that is get our army of people, like it, share it, and make sure it gets in everybody's inbox. You're speaking Art's language right now. He wishes every one of his clients over the years had your attitude. Oh, well, then I, I would have a lot less clients. <laughs> <laughs> That's, true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. They wouldn't need art if they knew how to do it, I guess. Right? Yeah, well, they did know how to win. But it is, is, it's, it, it is great to hear Senator Testa, Chairman Testa, speaking about a commitment to winning. And, um, and that's something that we know here in Monmouth County, where we con have controlled the freeholder board for a long, long time. And we've been a Democratic county by registration since 2008. Um, and we, 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 we keep fighting it back. And there's been a lot, you know, 
Democrats keep trying and keep failing. So I uh, empathize with you and I'm going to encourage you to pick Chairman Holman's brain and co-chairman um, Hanlon's brain for, but, and, and share. You know, and I know the, the three of us were actually, four of us were actually chatting in Atlantic City last year or maybe the year wow. before they introduced me to you. But, um, but, but, but there, there's a commitment to winning there. And that's, um, you, you nailed it. You know, uh, losing with nobility is um, um, a, a bad trait on the New Jersey Republican uh, Party through a lot of parts of the state. And, um, you know, you said that you were the first district to flip in like 28 years. Well, only flip in our way. We've had a lot of flip the other way because yes. we didn't have a, um, a will to win like you obviously have. Wait, speaking of will to win, and you know, as I, in listening to everything, I, there, there's an I don't I can't break some news, but I want to give you and maybe your commit your committee an opportunity to break some news, inquiring into something that um, several people have asked me to inquire into um, since about May or June of last year, and it has to do with winners and losers, and it has to do with nursing homes. And, um, and I think your committee will probably have more of a staff than, than I have. But I think there's an opportunity to investigate um, who the winners and losers are, or when we know who the losers are, the, the seniors and their families who perished in the nursing homes. But who are the winners in that? Um, who, who benefited by those people um, being sent back to nursing homes and long-term care facilities when they were COVID positive. Um, and who did the, who, who did those winners, uh, is there a history of political donation? Um, so, so, you know, and a lot of that information is publicly available. So the, um, I, 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 there's some smoke around um, certain long-term care companies being big donors um, that got made a lot of money on those people who were sent into nursing homes. So the, um, that's, an, that's an area that, that I've been inquiring into, haven't had a lot of time to, but if the committee can ask some questions about that, or I don't know if you're gonna have the, uh, I think you might be able to make some national news um, if you break that open. I mean, Absolutely. I mean, that's an area of inquiry. I'll, I'll, I'll take your lead on that. Or, yeah. I, mean, look, you you know, do, to, I don't, I don't do. care about breaking the story. I'd rather you, I'd rather, you know, the, the, the mainstream media be forced to cover it because you broke the story in your hearings. You know, we, we do know this. I mean, we do know some facts. N nursing homes got to keep big dollars when people stay in their beds, right? And we, we know that for a fact. We know with Governor Cuomo, he gave immunity to nursing home executives after big campaign donations. I mean, you know, seems to me like almost the ultimate in quid pro quo. And it, it just amazes me that, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get a little nerdy on everybody here, you know, how, mu how, how much Governor Cuomo has been applauded the entire COVID-19 era and, you know, Ayn Rand is one of my favorite authors. The Fountainhead's my favorite book of hers. Um, you know, if, if anybody knows this reference, you know, I apologize. It means you've spent way too much time in your room alone reading books like I did. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's a, uh, you know, is a reference. I, I, I call him the gallant gallstone of, of governors. And, you know, if, if people read The Fountainhead, they know that The Gallant Gallstone was a book that was a horrible book, but was promoted by a critic named Ellsworth Toohey in, in The Fountainhead. And he wanted to see how much power he had by promoting the worst book possible. And he realized how much power he had when he went to, a, you know, a cocktail party and everybody was chatting about The Gallant Gallstone being this revolutionary book, basically, that he that he had been promoting. And that's Governor Cuomo. I mean, yeah. it, it, here's, here's a person that has blood on his hands. There's no doubt about it. He has blood on his hands. He's a bad actor. Puts COVID-19 positive patients into the nursing homes, forces them in there. And 
has done almost everything wrong during the COVID-19 era, and he's getting applauded by the, the news, the mainstream media. Now, all of a sudden, they realize maybe he wasn't such a good actor. Maybe he wasn't right. But he, he won an Emmy, for crying out loud. I mean, how does that even happen? I mean, and you had I people- wouldn't, I wouldn't assume that, you know, it's easy to say, you know, and we all used to joke about it, that Murphy just kept following Cuomo. And I, you know, remember people complaining that Cuomo was governor of New York and New Jersey back in, right. in March, April, and May last year. But um, if you dig into that, um, you know, the nursing home and who the winners and losers were and who did they give their donations to, um, you might find that there's, it, it was that the Murphy administration may not have been um, following Cuomo blindly. And there, there may, and there may be, or maybe there were, because you know I didn't look into the donations in um, in New York or um, how many nursing homes those corporations own, own in New York too. So maybe it was. And NPR of all news outlets, you wouldn't expect they actually did some investigating reporting into the um, the veterans' home in Metuchen and where they ended up getting patients from. So if, if you do a little, for your staff and your investigators, do a little Googling of um, Metuchen Veterans Home um, and you know, the NPR, they, 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 they started, but then they kind of slowed down. You mean when, Menlo Park, Art? Menlo Park, did I say Metuchen? Well, yeah, you said Metuchen, but I, 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 think, I think everybody knew what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and you, you, you think about even, you know, Governor Murphy, again, how he's always applauding everybody that, you know, this person needs no introduction or, you know, I mean, Governor Murphy right now is telling us what a great job yeah. his administration is doing with the unemployment disaster we have in our state. You know, it's so good uh, that we don't have to fix the system. Right. I mean, we have a COBOL system I've criticized from the, from the early stages now he says it, it, it would be a waste of resources. And I believe that's a direct quote, a waste of resources if we were to update our infrastructure for unemployment in this state, because he believes that the real problem is on the federal side. Um, it, it amazes me, you know, my office has helped out over 4,100 of our constituents with unemployment. Are other states having the problem as badly? You know, to me, I, I'm, I'm focusing in, in our backyard. Yeah, no, no, me too. But that seems like the logical thing. You're saying, well, it's a federal problem. They're not giving us the money fast enough or whatever. The feds right. just provide money. It's up to the state to distribute the money. And, if, right. you know, Pennsylvania and North Carolina and Mississippi and Alabama are all using COBOL or Fortran or whatever right. they use. The... Um, um, then I mean, I'll tell you this much, Art. I spoke to somebody about this exact issue today on the phone, and they said that one of the uniquely bad characteristics about New Jersey's unemployment crisis is that you can't get someone on the phone. Yeah, there's no accessibility. In other states, there's been delays. I mean, look, when you have this many people on unemployment, no one expects it to be completely smooth, but you can at least get a human being that can give you some right. kind of guidance. Here in New Jersey. You've got a situation where people that are waiting for a check to feed their families cannot get a representative of this administration to talk to, to even get a timeline, some guidance, unless they've got a, a, a state legislator like Mike Testa that actually has taken their case seriously. They are completely up a creek without a paddle. Yeah. No, and, and, so in that know, respect, it's, it's different. No, and, and you look at it this way, my office has been working every day during COVID-19, we've been working every day. We've become a satellite office for unemployment, but unemployment isn't working every day. You're getting a call center. You're getting a third party call center. You're not even getting representatives from unemployment. I mean, you know, so, so, so think about this. It's so bad, our system, that Governor Murphy's only placed $7 million in the, in the budget. We have the money available to it, but it, it seems to me, Governor Murphy's more obsessed, and I mean that, obsessed, with p engaging in pure identity politics and giving more money to, you know, our illegal immigrant legal fund. 
I mean, it makes absolutely no sense what he's doing. And many of these individuals, I can tell you that I've spoken to personally, not just representatives from my office. This is the first time they've ever had to file for unemployment in their entire working lives. These folks are stressed out to the max. We've even had individuals, God forbid, who were borderline suicidal contacting our office because they are having an impossible time to make ends meet. And yet you can't even get an in-person appointment at unemployment if you're one of the real problem cases. But it amazes me that this, this duty of unemployment has been dished off to legislative offices if we're willing to take them, which my office has been the entire time. But that's not what the purpose of a legislative office is supposed to be. We've become this satellite office helping out on women. You know, it's, 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 it's ridiculous. And one of the things I appreciate about what the point you've been making, though, is that, you know, not only are the mechanics of government here terrible and being executed poorly, but this is also a man-made crisis. We shouldn't be in this position. We shouldn't be at a point in uh, March 2021 where restaurants are still operating at a third of their capacity. So you've got uh, all of these New Jersey workers at home unable to feed their families. And there was actually a horrible story um, out of Monmouth County recently. I'm sure you saw it, Art. Uh, former Lieutenant Governor Kim Guadagno got involved. Yeah. But there was a young girl who was reportedly crying on Zoom because she was hungry. Yep. She was and starving. at least according to, Repub to the public details, it wasn't because uh, she had a deadbeat parent or anything no. like that. She simply had a parent who had kids to feed and was unable to work because of the economic conditions created by Phil Murphy. Phil Murphy is the reason this family is starving. Back to the point that Senator Testa made, my fellow attorney, that's the proximate cause. Unemployment incompetence made it work worse. There are certainly other factors at play, but Phil Murphy is the number one reason why people are hurting right now. And we have to continue to say it. Well, we have to continue to say it because it's true. Yeah, yeah. it's 100% true. And I wanted to ask about the school situation because um, the two largest school districts in, in New Jersey, Newark and Jersey City, do not have a return in-person date. Uh, the school's situation is a nightmare. We're talking about people that are destitute. You're talking about kids, uh, God forbid, being suicidal, having mental problems, falling behind. Yeah. I mean, how do we get these schools reopened, Senator? Dan, you know what's funny? <laughs> Again, we're supposed to be following the science. I think it was three weeks ago the CDC said we could return to school without our teachers being vaccinated. Without Actually, everyone. We haven't being... heard Murphy say that in a while. And and right. here it was. This is from the CDC. Yet we have our own state saying you can't go back to school. It's too dangerous. Right. You know. I'm blessed. I have three children. Two of my children are in parochial school. They've been at school the entire school year, every day, full time. Yep. There's been four cases in the entire school. Four. My oldest is in a public school. You know, the socialization has changed. It's dramatically different. I'm, that I'm seeing it in my own house. It's like the tale of two cities. You know, it's, I have two that are in parochial school. My oldest tested into a, an advanced school for fifth grade and up. And I, I see how she's handling it and, it's, and, it, and it hurts. I, I talk to other families whose children are at that same school. They're, they're saying, should we have taken our kids out of the parochial school because they tested into this high level school? They haven't been, they haven't been really back. I mean, they're, they're now on a hybrid. But again, if you have working families, how do they function with the hybrid? This, again, is a direct cause, not even a proximate cause, this is a direct cause of Phil Murphy's actions. And nobody seems to be taking the lead to say, you know, Dan, you have a hard stop date where you're returning back to school full time, this date, period, full stop. You don't have that. Where is the leadership? I mean, instead of, again, who, who's whose science are we following now 
when the CDC says our yeah. children belong back in school. Dr. Fauci said our children belong back in school. And you know who I feel the worst for? Our special needs students who have been left behind horribly this entire COVID-19 era. This entire COVID-19 era, these special needs students have been left behind. We are going to be seeing the ripple effect of this for years to come. And again, to your point, Matt, this is why elections matter. And the real tragedy is, you know, we talked about the tragedy with the, the seniors dying earlier than they need to by being forced into a um, um, nursing home. It's also, it's, it's going to have perhaps permanent in impact on a lot of these children. And I, I'm reminded of a friend of mine's son um, who do, you know, here in, in Monmouth County, we, we were hit pretty hard by Hurricane Sandy. And his family were living in the high school with several other families for a month um, in, in November of 2012. And he said then, and it's true now, nine years later, uh, or almost nine years later, that you know that there's permanent damage in terms of the kids' development, and um, stuff that you know it's going to take a long time to get over. And we have no idea the impact that it's going to be on our children if we're shut down for a year. And I, I just want to underline the context in case anybody's coming in earlier, but coming in late and. Um, didn't hear the context that Senator Tesla created earlier, is that people need to be responsible. And, we, and we, we're all taking COVID personally um, and seriously, but there's gotta be a, you know, a level of trust for people and that people, people are taking it seriously. There's some people who aren't gonna take it seriously and you know, maybe we can call them knuckleheads, but you know, the governor kind of brushed everybody with the brush of knuckleheads. And, <laughs> You know, me who's in my 60s with some comorbidities, I shut down for the year by choice. You know, but other people could, you know, but that, and that was my choice. I didn't go to events, I didn't go to parties. I'd only meet with one or two other people at a time, which was a big adjustment for me. But people with young kids, they should be in school. They should be going, doing their soccer games and their football games. Um, and the adults, should be and the business owners, you know, the, the the restaurant owners in particular, you know, they they they're out of business if they're not keeping clean. And the gym owners, you know, the the Atlantic Club and Wall and Red Bank, you know, they, what they've done to keep their place safe and inside and outside, they're the most resilient, smartest, ingenious people in terms of making stuff work. And Murphy has been from top down listening to. McKinsey for 35 million bucks on, on what to do and his Ivy League, you know, 20 year old kids on his staff um, making decisions with no experience at all. And, you know, McKinsey's telling opioid com uh, companies how to give rebates to pharmacies for every overdose, you know, and then they're telling people how to, you know, the Cuomo and Murphy to put seniors with COVID into nursing homes and shut the schools down. And then, the, and, the, let's, and let's tell the truth, that's about the NJEA shutting the schools down. Even the teachers, you know, who, the, who, who love to, who still love to teach, they want to be back in the school. Our, there's a, there's, we have a lot of, we have a large block of teachers in Legislative District 1 who I've had Zoom, Zoom meetings with that this was months ago. Yeah. that said we need to be back in school this is yeah. what we need this is where we need to be and you know they're, they're actually speaking from the heart because they know their children meaning their students yeah. they 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 miss their students and you know obviously you know even though Vineland is the largest land area it's a small town you know a lot of people know each other and they stay in touch via social media you know they they miss their students and they know that their the parents of those students want their students in school so that we can, you know, I'm tired of hearing about the new normal, the new normal. I want to get back to normal. Look, yep. the, the, you know. And these teachers the know that remote learning is not working for the children. No. Right, that's also a big point. I mean, even the teachers I know that are uh, further on the 
section of the slide scale where they're concerned about COVID, they may be more cautious to return. Even they will tell you that remote learning has been a disaster. Democrats love to talk about children being left behind when it suits them. Right. We talked a moment ago about this young lady out in Monmouth County who couldn't even get something to eat because of the nature of remote learning. There are so many children, to Art's point, that are never going to quite recover when it comes to their reading level, their mathematical ability, whatever other traditional barometer you want to use because of this crisis. And, and, and something I want to ask you about, uh, Senator, you mentioned a minute ago, you've got some kids in private school. Um, I did both. I did public school and then I did private school for junior high and, and uh, high school. I'm a big believer in school choice yep. for uh, sure. a number of obvious reasons. But one of the things that does frustrate me generally about the Republican Party in this state is we very rarely try to make that school choice argument. And now I feel as if it's the perfect time it to run on it. absolutely the perfect time. And, and, it, and it's, it, and to Art's, I think Art was about to say it. I mean, you know, this is an issue that marries both the concerns of the suburbs where we've lost ground, our base that believes in freedom of choice and the right to decide what's best for your children, and also the places where we're trying to break in, urban communities, where there are a lot of black and brown Americans who have truly suffered because of this crisis well, and the lack of access in. to in-person education. How about we education? educate the kids? How about we take care of those kids that we've been neglecting and throwing tons of billions of quote unquote Abbott dollars, yeah. wasting, you know, and like, you know, Dan mentioned Jersey Damn City right. and Newark and Essex County, and you've got it down in, in, in Camden. And we've got, we've got two Abbott districts here in, in Monmouth County. Let's educate the kids. You know, and let's let's give some real choice and let's engage it. You know, it's you know, we got to throw out the political playbook this year. And I think Jack Tutorelli is doing it. Um, and he, I think he's the right leader to do it. But certainly, Senator, you know, um, you can you can push and we need a push in Trenton. You know, we need we're going to have new leadership in, in the legislature next year, no matter how many seats we gain. Um, the, um, you know, so the, you know, we need to, we need more aggressive leadership coming out of Trenton, um, as in state street and the state house. Look, you know, this issue is ripe. I mean, it, it absolutely is. And again, there's so much ripe, low hanging fruit that King Murphy continues to give us all of the time. You know, I look at my own district and we're getting massive budget cuts. Massive budget cuts for education in legislative district one. So how much does the Murphy administration and Murphy himself care about our kids when we're getting massive funding cuts in Republican districts, right? I mean, so-, so it's, all let's, over. Let's... it's all over, you know, district one and Tom's River was a client of mine, you know, they got crazy cuts. They, they actually, look, you know, I, I'm still a freshman somewhat, you know, somewhat as a senator and, and you know i got to see you know our second budget hearing last year i sit on the budget committee was you know probably a couple of days before the world shut down so to speak and all of tom's river you know they had they were representing in big numbers at that yeah. at that hearing um it's 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 disturbing um my matt to your point my wife is a public educator one of the common complaints is how many kids are actually showing up for their remote learning sessions. Yep. You know, I mean, not turning in their homework because there's no way to police it. Sure. It's, or it's, maybe it's a good faith reason, right? Maybe you've got a one parent household where mom and dad needs to work. So they can't give you the attention that you need at home. Sure. Um, you know, again, this is something when you, if, if you didn't know you were listening to the Save Jersey blog, these are things that Democrats would have you believe they have a monopoly on caring about. But time and time again, when the rubber hits the road, they never really give a shit. It's just the truth. I'm sorry, no, of course, about it, but it's, it's the truth. So my, my original question, though, is, you know, I, I know that you talk about school choice. I mean, isn't it time for Republicans in the state to take up the banner and say, listen, we're going to have a voucher program for kids in this state. And particularly if you're in a school district that refuses to open and refuses to serve your kids and refuses to put your property tax dollars to work for the next generation, 
you're going to get some of those property tax dollars back and you're going to have the same opportunity that a rich a-hole like Phil Murphy has to send his kid to another school. Phil Murphy doesn't have to be stuck which whatever school his geography dictates for his children. Right. Your zip code shouldn't be able to dictate, you know, your, your life's path for the rest of your life. Right. I mean, Amen. Yes. You know, that, and, and that's been happening in the state of New Jersey, you know, for long before you and I were a, a glimmer in our parents' eyes, Matt. Um, you and know, what a break glimmer we were. Oh, oh well, there's no doubt about but that. Dan, I mean, and I still are. Dan and I can remember it. That way. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Look, you know, I, I've said it for a long time. You know, we need to really rethink our property tax structure in the state of New Jersey. Yeah. Why are senior citizens who are struggling to make ends meet, living on a fixed income, paying for schools that their children haven't attended for 30, 40 years? It, it doesn't make much sense to me that this is how our school fund formula works. You know, look, you know, Jack Cittarelli obviously is more than likely going to be the candidate for, for governor this year as, as on the Republican side. You know, school funding was a major issue for him in 2017 and his school funding formula was really, really smart. I mean, we need to really rethink New Jersey. And again, if we're going to save Jersey, Matt, we're going to save Jersey. Shameless we, plug. I mean, look, it's not a shameless plug for me. I mean, it's, it's, it's the truth. If we're really yeah. serious about saving Jersey, we have to change the entire culture. You know, you and I had a, a conversation, you know, Carville was famous for saying, you know, it's the economy, stupid. I, I think that still holds true, but it's also, it's the culture, stupid, right? I mean, because, you know, we, we talk about schools and, and our schools are shut down. If, if the, if the Democrats that really run things in the state of New Jersey really cared about our kids, many of those kids rely on school for two meals a day. Yeah, in, in That's Essex County and in Hudson County, you know, the, the, this is the this is the year for us to to to, re, to really go in there and and you know maybe we don't win, but we sure got to try. And we got to show our faces. Our we have to show our faces in places. Yep. Republicans are typically not either there or not comfortable being there. I mean, you know, look, I, I, I'm a member of my community in Cumberland County and it is very diverse. I take criticism uh, from, from a lot of different folks for, you know, individuals I've supported, uh, stances I've held. And you know what? You withstand the flames. You have to be able to, you have to be able to get in the cauldron every now and again and, yeah. with, and, withstand, and withstand those flames. And if if they get to know you, and I've all, and I've always said this, and COVID nineteen era has destroyed this. It's really hard to hate somebody sitting across from a table from them, breaking bread with them. It's hard. It's hard. So I, I think Republicans need to go to those. Look, look, you know, I'll say one of the biggest political events in Cumberland County is the ham and oyster dinner in Port Norris. I mean. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I can tell you, Congressman Lobiondo, it's twice a year. Congressman Lobiondo never missed one. You know, you just get randomly sat at tables with people that aren't, you know, you're not, you didn't arrive with. You, you probably aren't going to mix it up with. Folks, you may never see again. And guess what? You start showing your face in Port Norris at the Ham and Oyster Dinner in Cumberland County. People remember you. They say, hey, wow, you came there. It's, it's put on by the volunteer fire company down there. It's one of the great, by the way. Matt, on me. Come, come down next time. I mean, uh, you, you can come with me. It's takeout oh, yeah. only. The last two have been takeout only, which really stinks. But it, yeah. you know, I'm coming too. I'll bring the hand sanitizer. That's fine. That's fine. <laughs> all, of you, all of you are invited. I love it there. I've, I've been going. You know, I've probably been going for at least a dozen years in a row. I don't miss one. Yeah. I, I, I love. You know, I think Republicans need to get back to doing those things. And you know, I, you know, we used to call it maybe the rubber chicken circuit. You got to go. Like if the North Italy Hall's having a chicken barbecue in Vineland, go. You know, you know those well, the are the risk things. of being corny, though. It's it's really a great way to bring us down the home strips this evening because you know one of the strengths of this country is our is our not just our right of free association, but our our ability to form communities and to be reliant on one another and our own enterprise and our own efforts, not some distant government or king or power that wants to orient our lives for us. And we have so many strong, wonderful communities in New Jersey and 
these pandemic restrictions, they're not just killing our jobs, they're not just destroying our children's opportunity to get an education. It's also robbing us of a lot of what makes New Jersey, New Jersey. And I, I know that's something you're gonna talk about in this election. And I hope sure. it's something that Jack Cittarelli, who is also um, an unapologetic Jersey guy is also gonna tap into uh, this year. We're not just fighting for our livelihoods. We're not just fighting for our children, even though those things are all supremely important. We're fighting for who we are as a state, damn it. Um, I mean, we're, we're Jersey. I love what we you're saying. I love yeah. what you're saying, yeah. Matt. You know, I, I mean, some jackass, to use his phraseology, not mine, from Massachusetts, is it going to come in here and tell me that I can't go eat oysters with Mike Testa in Cumberland County indefinitely until he says otherwise? Well, Look, you know, it's. I'll, I'll give you a little preview into something. Um, it's an idea I gave to Jack. Uh, you know, look, I like Jack. I'm friends with Jack. You know, I'm, there's that's who, you know, I'm not allowed to endorse as county chairman, but I can say this, that's who I want as my running mate. I want Jack Cittarelli as my running mate in this election. I want to be very clear about that. Well, your choice is um, right now, though, to be fair, pretty weak. <laughs> the alternatives. Well, Jack's well, great. I don't mean Jack's weak. I mean the alternatives to Jack are, mm. you know, I'm, 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 I'm going to get I'm, some, I'm going to get some guff for saying that, but it is, you know, well, I'm, I'm it, not happens, gonna... it happens to be true. And there's actually, sorry to interrupt Senator, but there was actually a really good sign for Jack um, today. And that Murphy took a shot at it. You know, David Wilson yeah. got the article on the Jersey Globe. You're right. And for, for Murphy to be engaging the presumptive nominee of the Republican Party in March, that is a good sign. They, they either made a very you know, basic mistake or they got polling data, which is uh, concerning them. And given who they've hired to run that campaign, I think it's the latter. I think I think that that was a great sign, you know, and that Jack was working his tail off and getting known, and his message is beginning to resonate, and he's extraordinarily disciplined. Absolutely, I mean, look, you know, look how out of touch Murphy has been the entire time. And as you said, a person from Massachusetts who who openly says that the Bill of Rights is above his pay grade, and that if taxes are your problem, then New Jersey is not your state, right? I mean. I mean, you know, how out of touch can he be? But to talk about real Jersey stuff, like, you know, again, Jack and I have talked quite a bit. I really like, and I'm not saying this because we're on Facebook Live. I really, really like Jack, not as just a gubernatorial candidate. I like him as a human being, as a Jersey guy. Um, and, and, you know, for those that followed my campaign in 19, they know I did the minute with Mike. Um, Jack is doing something similar. Uh, you know, certainly when he's an LD1, we're, we're planning on doing something together. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I always said I, I liked Babe Ruth because he called his shot. So here's, here's a shot I'll call that. And I'm hoping Jack implements this throughout the state. And it's an idea that I came up with called a Jersey slice of life. And you guys know I love pizza. Um, it's kind of a thing with me. It's, you know, I, I eat it at least once a week. It's usually up to three times a week. It's, more, it's probably more close to the reality of what happens. But it's always on Friday it, where, you know, I'm sitting down with, a you know, a potential voter, a constituent with Jack and, and certainly when he's in legislative district one, he and I will be together with, and hopefully with Antoine and Eric as well, where we're sitting with a, you know, a Jersey person, a real Jersey person and ask him a question like, you know, what, what's, what's been affecting you. Yep. And guess what? I, I think it's going to be very effective to hear it come out of the words. You know, I mean, hear it come out of the mouths of those individuals who have been affected by, the tyranny, and I mean that, it's just, this is tyranny of the Murphy administration. Uh, and, you know, what better way than, you know, hopefully um, safe, you know, I don't think it's necessary, but safe socially distancing over over a, a, a few slices of pizza, a, you know, a Jersey slice of life from two with two Jersey guys or more, you know, myself, Eric, Antoine, and Jack. I, I think that's going to be a really tough, a tough message to attack because you know no amount of money that you could throw at that this is going to be really genuine this is going to be real and, and it's going to be cut in real time kind of like this so it's not like we're hiding you know it's, and that's precisely the sort of situation that murphy is so awkward in that he is so yeah. ill at ease in that he is so ill-equipped for and i bring you back to when that woman confronted him in the restaurant and he was startled he froze 
he completely froze. Now, someone must have said to him, you know, if somebody confronts you like this, show no reaction at all. But he may as well have been comatose. And this will be a marvelous contrast because Jack is a great schmoozer, yeah. as are you. But well, I, think, I think Jack or Mike would have engaged him. I think Chris Christie would have hit her. But, <laughs> but the point is they would, have, they would have given a real person's reaction. I think that's part of what you're getting at, right, Dan? Yeah, Absolutely. and look, I'm not encouraging anyone. Look, I, you know, I'm, I'm as unhappy as anybody is with Governor Murphy and, yeah. you know, what I, what I think is unconstitutional overreach, you know, since that, at the end of that 15 days to flatten the curve for crying out loud. But I'm not encouraging anybody to confront the governor that way. That's no, not, that, no, that's not, I'm, not yeah. I'm not saying that. I was just setting up a contrast because sure. it, it was a Jersey kind of situation, like when when uh, Governor Christie was confronted uh, on the boardwalk that time. Sure. Um, and he and he responded uh, in a way that a lot of Jersey people could relate <laughs> to. Okay. Oh, 100 percent. I mean, look, you know, and, and you know, to Matt's point, you know, Bill Murphy. It's just not one of us, right? I mean, nah. he's not. He's he's nah. not one of us. He's not a guy that you know goes goes to seaside and, and grabs Maruka's pizza. He's not a guy that goes down the Wildwood and grabs Sam's Pizza Palace. He's not. He's not one of us. I mean, you know, he has to be shown where those places are. Whereas you thought he, he was kidding when he said he knew all these pizza places. He knows every damn pizza place in all twenty-one counties. Uh, pretty much. I mean, listen. It's you know, there's. I don't know about all 21, but I'll bet you 17 of them. I, you know, I'm, I, I, I wouldn't 17. know where to go for pizza in Sparta, New Jersey. I will tell you that. Like, I, I wouldn't know where to go there. Well, but, who's, you know, for, whose district is Sparta? Is that uh, LD20? No, not <laughs> six. That's LD24. That's like Parker. That would be right? Parker. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, would Parker. be Parker. Oh, the spaces will take you to a pizza place. Right. They would They would know where to go. Exactly. And yeah. They, they put venison on their pizza. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, Art, <laughs> Art, you took the words out of my mouth. You took the words... <laughs> out of my mouth i said it was going to be venison or squirrel but you know you never know like uh you know look it's the you know the, the fact of the matter is yeah and you know senator oroho could he's up there as well he could he, i'm sure he knows where to go um but you know look we're jersey folks and i think even even the jersey democrats now are looking at phil murphy saying what did we get with this guy well, they were saying that before the pandemic, too. <laughs> I mean, he, he was a year, a year or two into office when the pandemic hit, and they were tired of him. They, I mean, privately, they would tell you, "We got to get rid of this guy." And you know, the, the you know the pandemic's the best thing that happened to his career at this point, or <laughs> or maybe six months ago. But I think it's well, coming to an end. Oh, I, I think it's going to come to an abrupt end, the same way Cuomo's appears to be coming to an abrupt end. In, in in New York, you know, you know what's funny to me is, you know, um, and I don't want to get this gentleman's name wrong. Is it Assemblyman Kim, um, who who first was pointing out the hypocrisy of the Cuomo administration and what was happening in long term care facilities there? What's amazing to me is that he said that Governor Cuomo threatened him and yelled at him for forty five minutes on the phone. Yeah. You know, a Jersey guy would not allow, allow anyone <laughs> to, to yell at them for 45 minutes on the phone. I mean, I can imagine 45 seconds and then, you know, myself, Matt, Dan or Art, I, I'm sure we'd say, are you done yet? And hang up the phone if they didn't stop. I mean, it was amazing to me that he allowed the governor to yell at him for 45 minutes. You know, no offense. My dad never yelled at me for 45 minutes. I'll be damned if I'm letting anybody else do that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's, there's so many ins and outs of the situation, but I mean, hopefully we can collectively continue to get the word out about Phil Murphy and everything he's doing to this state, because it's as bad or, or as worse as what the media is finally starting to cover in New York. So hopefully uh, this Friday will be not the start of it, because some of us have been talking about this stuff for a while, but hopefully the beginning of a new phase where we can really drill down on some of these issues. Are you participating in Friday's hearing? I'm I sure am. you're involved in, okay, so you will be there. I, I am going to be there. And, and you know what disappoints me the most about this? And it shows the ugliest side of partisan politics. Where are the voices from the Democratic Party 
criticizing Phil Murphy. Where are they? Universally quiet. And that, you know, that's actually, I'm really glad you said that because have you confronted any of your Democrat colleagues about their silence and their unwillingness to restrict this guy's emergency authority? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes. And, yeah. and did they give you an answer? None, none that you'd, you know, appreciate hearing, you know, it's just, yeah. you know. It's, well, Jamal it's, it's, Howell is the only one who is taking them on and they get, look what happened to him. Yeah, they're primarying him. They're going to take him out. Well, no, they, he was. They, well, he's running for Senate now. Yeah, Jamal. but that's because they were going to take him they out. They were going to take him out. They were going right. to take him out anyway, because might as well try to get some more headlines. But, go, to the, right. go for the top job. He was talking about primarying Murphy. That's why they were taking him out of assembly. You know, which Jamel says some crazy stuff. Well, he is crazy. But, I, but I don't he, have any problem with it that he's leaving. But you know, but he's an example of somebody. No who dissent. Stood up and quashed. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I saw. You know, he. You know, to use our lexicon, uh, Matt, he, he appears to be Exhibit A as to what happens when you stand up to the machine, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah, very, they're, they're disciplined. very disciplined. No, very I mean, look, you know, um, uh, it was no shock. Here it was, you know, Senator Weinberg stands up, makes the motion to table our motion to relieve the bill to take away the unfettered executive power of Phil Murphy. I mean, I can't believe that that many people look, you know, there's where you see the silence. Go look at those votes. I made the motion to relieve once. Senator Doherty made the motion to relieve once. And then um, Senator Oraho has a, you know, a constitutional amendment that he tried to get put forth. That was tabled as well. So go look at those partisan votes and you'll see, you know, who's, who's towing the line and who's not. Well, I'll, I'll definitely be tuning in on Friday and we're going to make sure that we say we share the links. And I think that there's a Facebook live stream associated with nice. Friday's hearing. So we're going to we're going to definitely tune in for that. And uh, we're probably going to uncover some things that aren't going to make us happy. There's a lot of sad, dark stuff that's going to come out. Sure. As we delve deeper into the nursing home crisis. But it, 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 it's what people need to hear um, because a tragedy happened and it was an avoidable tragedy. And as Art kind of hinted at, I think we're going to ultimately find out um, it was a tragedy for some, but less of a tragedy for others. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, you, if you vote in 2021 without getting this full story, shame on you. It was willful blindness because we're going to make sure you find out about it. Uh, it, and it's, it's proof, it, Matt, it's yeah. proof, Matt, that we're not all in this together. You know, we're we, not, <laughs> yeah. That's what we also keep hearing. Oh, we're, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. We'll tell that to the small business owner. Stronger fair, but for who? Right. I haven't, I haven't met the person. I haven't met the happy parent. I haven't met the, the uh, reinvigorated small business owner. Um, I was joking with you guys offline earlier today. I had to go to the MBC today. Uh, it was a collection of humanity from all over the state of New Jersey, and they were all united in being disgusted with the incompetence of their government, right? Because the MBC is where the, where the rubber hits the road. This is where your average person Quite interacts literally. most intimately with their government. And, uh, you know, no offense to the individual workers there. There were some great hardworking people, but the system that they're working in is, is pathetic. So. Um, we got to continue to drill down on these issues, but I do see that it is quarter after 10 in the East here. And I, I, I think this might be the longest we've gone so far. I think we went longer with Jack. Did we go longer with Jack? I think we went a full hour and a half. I think we went a full two hours with Jack. I think we actually tried to give him an out and he kept going and we were fine with it because we we're having a good time. And then at some point, Jack was like, all right, I got to go walk my dog. Right. I don't have a dog and my kids are probably asleep at this point. They better be. Um, you, you, know, you, know what's interesting, you know what's interesting about this is, you know, the employees of the Motor Vehicle Commission got a 6% raise and stipends on the weekend for showing up to work. I mean, can you even imagine? So how are we all in this together? There's people out of work, desperate, and I mean desperate to desperate. get the, the money from unemployment that they're owed. These people are owed that money that they paid into the system. And yet our government workers get a 6% raise. I mean, how and, much, and this how is much after they told us we needed to borrow money. 
But I still. want the outdoor dining franchise for MVC. <laughs> Ooh. You'd make a, let me tell you something. You would have made a mint today. You could have retired just off of what I would have bought. Another missed opportunity. Art, yeah. get a food truck. I hope you can cook. You know, <laughs> food trucks bring, bring back bad, bad memories for me, but I can cook. I <laughs> thought the, the Motor Vehicle Commission was headed in the right direction and made the right changes and, and reforms or whatever under Governor Christie. And I think it was operating a lot better at that time. I don't know what the hell happened, but it seems to have completely gone to hell. I I'll tell you what happened. I can answer that for you. Ask Art. Meet Sue Fulton. Yep. She ran for she ran for freeholder when it was still freeholder in Monmouth County, right? She did. And she ran, if I remember correctly, on being this tough, get it done administrator type. Yeah, um, she, she and the did. Monmouth County voters saw through her, but Phil Murphy didn't. And the proof is now in the pudding that she has no clue what she's doing because the MVC is once again an absolute nightmare. And if you live in South Jersey, like uh, Mike Testa and Dan and I do, uh, you know, good luck getting access to a facility because right West Efforts closed because of COVID. So no, you got to go it, north. It, it, you know, and it appears that you know the Murphy administration is is full of people that have stumbled upward somehow. You know, and it, 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 you know, what you just said, you know, again, you know, it, it, I like the phrase stumbled upward. I particularly like that. Yeah. Just footnote me once, Dan, then it's yours. You own it after that. You own it. Um, <laughs> you know, but it, it really is sad. That seems to be the way of the Democrats. You know, you can just well, continue. got that job because, you know, because her running mate for freeholder turned it down. <laughs> Matt Doherty was offered the job first and he turned it down so he could go to the casino. So they, who's the next one down on the ballot? It's amazing. I mean, look, I mean, you know, Senator Cory Booker, he stumbled upward. I mean, he did a miserable job at, at, his, at his prior elected office, right? He did a miserable job. Now he's our U.S. <laughs> Senator. I mean, it's, you can't make this stuff up. He stumbled upward. I mean, how, how horrible of a record do you have to have as a mayor when people look at your tenure and say, eh, Sharp James, by comparison, not so horrible. And I know New right. Yorkers who say that. And Sharp James went to prison, for God's sakes. And, okay. and right. people are actually more sentimental for his tenure. Oh, there's no question before. about it. Yeah. Well, this is only in Jersey. This is only in Jersey. Right. And, and, I mean, Matt, look no further than what happened with Menendez. OK, there's well, another I mean, example, Menendez. So I think we could all agree. Can we agree on this? That people are going to have to be really, 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 really angry in November to turn this state around. Yep. One hundred percent. And if this isn't the year, you know, I don't mean to be like the alarmist in the room, you know, and, and I'm not engaging in hyperbole here. If this isn't the year that people realize they need to, you know, right the ship of the SS New Jersey, it ain't happening. No. It, you know, it, it ain't happening because you, you have a phenomenal presumptive candidate for, for governor, phenomenal. You know, you have all of the seats in the legislature up. This is the year for us to change. And, you know, talking about Senator Booker, you know, judging by his record, like, I think most mayors are kind of judged like, hey, what did you build while you're here? Were the roads fixed? Did we have nice roads? Did we have nice parks? Did we have clean water? <laughs> right? Like, you couldn't get drinking water right? Like, that seems to be pretty low-hanging fruit that you could fix. Not not, not in Newark. Not in Newark. But he went and shoveled his constituents um, snow. I saw the picture, but he wasn't wearing gloves. Well, I'll tell you what, though, that that plays into a point, though, that Senator Testa made. And, it, and it's it's the negative application of the principle. But showing up matters. Yep. Cory Booker didn't actually do his job. But there he was. He was at the community events. He was pulling cats out of trees. He was shoveling people's snow. Yeah, well, it would have been a lot better for Newark if he was actually fixing their lead pipes so kids <laughs> weren't being poisoned. But... 
that's what got covered. And that's the personal interaction people have with them. I mean, we've all experienced elected officials like that in our, in our lifetime where they've raised well, taxes, they've done a shitty job, but oh, they helped me get my driveway apron fixed. Yeah, look at Andy Kim cleaning up the Capitol Rotunda, sweeping stuff off the floor of the Capitol Rotunda after right. January 6th. And, and he snagged all the headlines. Well, what the hell was Andy Kim doing for the people of his district? We got people to clean the floor of the rotunda of the Capitol. Uh, please. I don't he should come back and he should clean up the mess that Phil Murphy made in NJ3. How many <laughs> businesses are not going to open in Ocean County this summer because of that guy? Yeah, get, get him some more school funding or get the Veterans Hospital. Yes. That, you know, that's been canceled you know, too many times. Let's get that Veterans Hospital, whether it be in Tom's River or Brick. Let's get it in there. Do you have a lot of interaction on a regular basis with, with Congressman Van Drew? Do I do. You talk about some of these issues. I mean, that's, you know, you actually in some ways were the pre-Van Drew. You were, you came along in 2019, you won. It was the precursor to his transformation to a Republican and subsequent victory. So I, I think a lot of people would be curious to know what your relationship is like. It's great. I mean, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm actually sitting in his unexpired term, you know, you know, in his seat. That's yes. where, you know, I mean, you know, this is it went from Van Drew to Andrews Act to me, you know, in the special election. So, you know, I'm, I'm fulfilling that that unexpired term, um, you know, that was from 2017 to 21. Um, you know, I could I could tell you I was integral in Congressman Van Drew, you know, converting. To, to my side of the aisle, there was a, a great meeting that we had um, in, at Dino's Diner in Seville, where we were probably about a three and a half hour breakfast before it all happened. And, you know, I got to be part of history. I mean, there's no doubt about it. Look, and he's been a champion for our party. I know he's getting vilified by, you know, by the left and, you know, for the stances that he's taken. And I, I'm, I'm, you know, really amazed by him. He's st stood strong the entire time. And, you know, and he's been in the line of fire, um, you know, since since he changed. And, you know, look, he, you know, he had a, a formidable opponent in Amy Kennedy. But I'll say it here. Kennedys can't win in Massachusetts right now. How, how the heck did they think they were going to win in the state of New Jersey? Yeah, that might have been the one. I mean, everybody's always threatening to loot, to move if their if their candidates don't win. Um you know, it's going to take a lot more than a lost election to get me to leave New Jersey. But seeing a Kennedy elected in South Jersey might have brought me close. That's a real sign of decline and decay if the Kennedys can get a foothold here. Well, and it, it, it amazed me. I mean, look, you know, I don't she seems like a very nice woman when I met her, but she called herself a mental health advocate. Yet you never saw one board that she sat on or one organization that she belonged to that advocated for mental health. Like, I mean, this is again, just like made up stuff. You know, you know what, what, how is she involved in the community there uh, in South Jersey? I mean, you know, but prior to her running, no one had ever heard, I mean, as far as I know, no one had ever heard of her in any major civic organization or being, yeah. a, being, being a mental health advocate like she championed herself to be. Um, so, you know, look, I, I, I knew Congressman Van Drew was going to win. I, I knew it, I mean, I, I usually bet a pizza. I'm owed a bunch of pizzas still from that one. But. <laughs> We're tough judges of character down here. I mean, we've seen it in a few elections recently. You can't just parachute in with cash and expect to win. Um, you got to be a little bit more, um, at least when you have a real opponent to confront. And, and in this case, Jeff Andrew, um, love him or hate him, he's a formidable, formidable politician. Um, and so and has established a brand has established a brand over a quarter century, right? I mean, yes. that's that's the truth of the matter. Look, I mean, and, you know, I don't want to just pat myself on the back here, but look, I ran against the Van Drew team. That was, that was the, those were the signs, right? The Van Drew team. The Van Drew team. I remember when I came back from college, that was, that was the first campaign I volunteered for. Um, the year that, that uh, Van Drew uh, beat Nick Aselta and uh, became a state senator. And 2007. 2007. And he was frustrating Republicans for a long time thereafter. Right. Um, so, you know, I mean, I think that's one of the great takeaways from this evening that, you know, we all have a lot of um, strong opinions about policy and um, its application in people's lives. But at the end of the day, 
Um, you got to show up. You got to convince people um, that you're a real person. Sure. And you better be a real person because otherwise you're not going to be able to convince them. Um, and you have to establish a relationship with the people you want to vote for. And you got to have a brand. If you don't have all that stuff, it doesn't matter how beautiful your idea about taxes contrasts with that of the person you're trying to unseat. It ain't going to matter for a host of reasons. Um, so, you know, apply that in 2021 if you're watching this and you're running for office or you're thinking about volunteering or you're running a campaign or doing whatever the hell it is you're going to do wherever you're going to be involved. Um, and definitely pay attention to this man, um, New Jersey's king of pizza, Mike Testa, who is one of our favorite legislators and uh, definitely a part of the solution in New Jersey because for many, many years, Dan and Art and I and our respective websites have been complaining that we need more candidates like him. And now we have him and there's some other ones that are coming up too. So, sure. you know, Senator, we appreciate you taking some time um, late on a Wednesday night. We know you're busy to talk to Save Jersey about what's going on in their state. And I know that um, you'll be back at least a couple more times this year. 100%. Um, during the course of this election, because things are going to develop. It's never boring around here. And we're going to need you to help us break it down. And I think next time I'll give you fair warning and we'll uh, maybe have some pizza and something to drink. Let's do it in person. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Let's do it in person. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. The hell with it. You're right. See, this is exactly the point, right? Because I'm totally cool with that. And I'm seeing people in person, but we're conditioned to not say it. It's not even a conscious thing. Let's do it in person and have pizza. Yes, we're not going to take the pizza to a nursing home and breathe on some elderly uh, uh, residents that have COPD, for God's sakes. But I feel good. Mike feels good. Let's have a pizza and have a whiskey, for God's sakes. Yes, like right, Americans. Gonna... Like, like Americans. Like, like free Americans. Let's let's plan it. Uh, State Senator Mike Testa, you're the man. Thank you so much. Great seeing you, gentlemen. We Have a great that. evening. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Dan Sarucci Thank you. of the Sarucci Blog Spot, Art Gallagher, more Mammoth Musings. Next week, I think, is that Bridget Kelly? That's it. Bridget Kelly next we week. Have, we have Bridget Kelly next week, everybody. Um, we said which, Bridget we'll, Kelly's name and Senator Testa hung up. <laughs> yeah, he's like, I'm out of here. I don't want to talk about this one. <laughs> but no, seriously, we're going to talk to her about election 2021. And we're also going to talk to her um, about uh, Bridgegate, of course, um, and kind of her story. And the week after that, we have Joe Panaccio, State Senator Joe Panaccio from the other end of the state, who's going to talk about the progress of the independent hearings that Senator Testa was just talking about. And then I think the week after that, we have the one and only Bill Spadia from NJ1015, who, you know, we're going to have to like tie Bill down to keep him on topic because i mean we're we're already all over the place bill's boundless energy is going to take us in god knows what direction and uh you know that'll be that'll be entertaining so definitely keep checking back every wednesday i think on bill's week we're actually going to do it at 8 p.m because bill gets up so early in the morning for nj1015 i said if you want to start a half an hour early we'll start a half an hour early. Okay. Matt, thank you very much thank, thank you guys you. i'm going to go jack's dog yeah. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. Everybody stay safe. Thanks for watching.